Lecture 5 for Western Civ 1, Classical Civilizations, Contribution to Western Civilization. As we start out today, uh, we want to be talking about the ancient Greeks and classical civilization. Uh, something that comes up time and time again in Greek writing as they moralize sometimes their history, as they make observations about themselves. They were certainly proud of uh, their wit, but at the same time they recognized that a great challenge for many people is pride, what they would call hubris. This is something that we find in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, as we find that the Proverbs writers also recognized that pride was a serious issue. We find in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, is that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and amongst the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. He who gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. There's a lot of people who are puffed up and proud, and in world history we find that happens time and time again. What's interesting to see here amongst the ancient Greeks is their uh, cultural achievements, things for which they're proud, but yet at the same time we find that sometimes in their pride they sowed seeds of their own destruction and uh, are going to come to be supplanted by people that they look down upon, uh, people from up in the hills of the north, hillbillies if you will, uh, the Macedonians. But God would use these people and these city-states that develop back in the time period when the Assyrians are the world power, back in uh, the Levant, back in the time period of the divided monarchy of Israel and Judah. Uh, God's working to raise up people that will have their role in time and space. As we think about ourselves, we don't know exactly how all God is working. We know something of his revealed plans, but uh, we want to be ready to be of service in his kingdom in our time and our place and to be careful not to be puffed up and proud but rather instead to be humble and to uh, humbly take up the role that we've been assigned a role of service uh, for god and a role of service to other people thinking about the ancient greeks here in classical greek civilization though uh, we've introduced last time a discussion about the two uh, classic examples of Athens and Sparta. But we want to go on uh, from there to talk about the history of these cities along with their sister cities and the other poles of Greece and uh, to look at their challenges in the time period beginning around the year 500 and going up until the time period of 335 when they're supplanted by the Macedonians of Ale led by people like Alexander the Great. Classical Greece had a number of challenges. Some of these challenges came from external forces, and some were internal. Things like pride that we were talking about here earlier. In their challenges, what we find is that they had, first of all, we've seen already, uh, struggles to get along when there's limited resources. And uh, sometimes that would lead to various problems along the way. But as these city-states uh, develop, what we find is the first major external challenge is that of the Persian invasion. The Persian Empire uh, had spread from over in what is today Iran, uh, across to Babylon, down to Egypt, and certainly had the uh, Israelites caught up within its empire. But as we study this period of classical Greece, we'll be particularly dependent upon the writings of historians like Herodotus. Uh, Herodotus writes a work on the Persian Wars. Uh, his history is sometimes seen to be uh, rather gullible uh, because he uh, accepts all kinds of stories that he's heard along the way and includes them within his account. Uh, but some people would call him the father of history. Now, the fact of the matter is that Moses was writing about a thousand years earlier and writing historical accounts. So uh, perhaps Moses ought to be better recognized as the father of history. But the father of Greek history is seen to be Herodotus, writing particularly his 
Persian Wars. Now the Persian Wars just don't talk about the Persian Wars since the Persian Empire extended over a broad territory. It also tells the history of faraway places like Egypt uh, as well as Babylon, the area of Mesopotamia, and Persia as well and their interactions with various people groups. So there's a lot of cultural history and geography that's embedded uh, within the Persian Wars. As we look at the Persian Wars, what we find is that Herodotus uh, helps us to see that the uh, Persians came to aspire to conquer Greece, to move further westward, in part because the Greeks had allied with their fellow Greek-speaking people on the Ionian coast, and in the year 499 had supported the Ionian revolt against Persian rule. The Eubians and the Athenians particularly sent small contingents of troops and materials to help in this revolt. Now that revolt in 499 was crushed by the Persians, uh, by Darius, and uh, the Persians though come to be uh, aware of these pesky Greek people across the Aegean Sea and decided that they wanted to control that area. And so as a result, some years later, Darius would invade. According to Herodotus, Darius had a servant to remind him, Master, don't forget the Athenians. But Darius' uh, first attempt at invading is frustrated. In 492, as his uh, navy brings uh, invaders, there's a storm off of Mount Athos, and the invasion fleet is capsized. And so the invasion is thwarted. A couple of years later, Darius once again invades, invades. Now it's the year 490 BC. And as the Persians come with their famous warriors and their great resources, um, there are some Greek city-states that uh, mediaize. Uh, they negotiate and they work out a peace ahead of time. Uh, and there's others that recognize that, hey, this is a threat to our civilization, and decide to resist. In 490, there's one famous battle that takes place. This is the battle at Marathon. It's a plain not too far east of Athens, about 25 miles east of Athens, uh, where there's a battle that takes place between the hoplites of the Athenians and the Persian invading fleet. Now, the majority of the Persian invading force didn't come to shore that day, but they're met by an Athenian force. Now, the Athenians wanted help, and they sent their runner off to Sparta, but the Spartans were busy having a religious festival, and the omens that they sought didn't come back well, and so they didn't send anybody to support um, this effort to resist the invading Persians. Remember, these two cities are something of rivals, not just at sports activities, but economically as well. And so, when this battle takes place, uh, the Athenians, with their phalanxes, are able to charge the Persians who are just coming ashore and to win the day. This would be a source of embarrassment to the Spartans that the Athenians would win a military victory uh, when they thought they were so great at it. But uh, this is a very interesting event that does create some uh, things that continue on for years to come. Now we've talked about the ancient athletic festivals shared by the Greek city-states. Uh, their long distance race was never 26 miles long. Uh, that's something that's a modern uh, convention that comes about with the invention of the modern Olympics. It's actually the distance between Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. That's where we get our 26 miles and uh, fraction uh, for the distance of a marathon. But it was fairly close to the distance between Athens and the plains of Marathon where the battle took place. According to Herodotus, uh, the runner who had been running back and forth uh, trying to recruit the Spartans uh, had run a very, very long time. But uh, as he came to the Plains of Marathon, he's already run extreme distances, but he's given one assignment, and that is to go back and tell the people of Athens not to give up. So supposedly after running a couple hundred miles, he now runs this last 25-mile stretch, and as he comes into the Athenian Agora, the marketplace, 
Uh, his dying gasp is the word Nike. Some of you might be wearing a swoosh on some shoes that you're wearing. Uh, we might say Nike. Uh, the word means victory. So the message that he brought in one word was that we won. Don't give up Athens. And so as a result, when the fleet would come around, the, the Persian fleet would come around, uh, they wouldn't give up and uh, surrender to the uh, Persians. The response to this was rather interesting in that certainly the Athenians were proud of their accomplishment in defending themselves against the mighty Persians. Uh, but also, uh, this would frustrate Darius, and his son would take up something of the memory of this. In the meanwhile, the Athenians got together in creating the Peloponnesian League, where cities from that peninsula that sticks down below the Balkan Peninsula would band together. And at about this time, the Athenians found silver in the hills nearby. So the question came to be, what should we do with the silver? Themistocles, who's the ruler at that time, uh, came up with a plan. His plan was based in part upon an oracle, a uh, revelation that was supposedly came from Delphi, their religious center. And the Delphic oracle had told them, when they required what they should do with their wealth, to depend upon their wooden walls. Now, for some Athenians, uh, that made them think about the defensive structures of the city, particularly the wooden walls that joined uh, the city of Athens to their port city called the Piraeus. But Themistocles reinterpreted this. Instead, he asserted that the wooden walls should be boats. And so immediately they embarked on a large uh, boat-building campaign, and this would be of pivotal importance uh, ten years later when the Persians came back. Darius's son is Xerxes. Xerxes led his invasion in the year 480. As a Persian empire emperor, he had lots of resources, uh, a very large land force, but also maritime forces. The navy of the Persians was actually the Phoenician navy. And so uh, the land forces were augmented by the naval forces, which could bring them resources, food along the way, for example. And as this invading force came down the coastline, uh, having crossed over the Hellespont, they're coming down the coastline, and they're met along the way at a pass along the coast, a place called Thermopylae. Now, there's actually a dual battle that takes place here. One is the battle at sea. That's called the Battle of Artemisium. And this is where the Athenian ships uh, cut off the supply lines of the Persians uh, to their forces. And so as their land forces come marching along the coast, they come to a place where the mountains come right to the sea, and there's a very narrow pass between the sea and the cliffs above. This is the site of Thermopylae. Now, at this occasion, the Greeks have decided to at least cooperate with each other, and the Spartans, not wanting to be left out of a victory, have sent 300 Spartans to go fight, led by their king, Leonidas. At Thermopylae, they're going to wage a battle which holds off the great Persian army. They don't have nearly the number of men, but within the narrow confines of that pass, they're way able to withhold the advance of this huge army. Now, if the navy had been able to do uh, what it would have aspired to do, that is, namely to transport soldiers around this blockage, they would have done so. But the Athenian navy at, Par at uh, Artemisium successfully held off the Persian fleet. The result was this large army is ground to a halt. And the Greeks have time to band together and build up their resources. While this battle is going on, uh, they're basically deciding on building an Isthmian wall. That would be a wall across that narrow neck of land that connects the uh, mainland to the Peloponnesus. So they're going to make another defensive stop there, thereby sacrificing the city of Athens. The battle at Thermopylae was a battle that was lost by the Greeks, but one which won great glory for the Spartans, who held the pass even as other forces regrouped for another battle. Once the Persians moved past Thermopylae, uh, 
uh, they moved on towards Athens, and Athens would be destroyed. While Athens was destroyed and its uh, structures were burned, uh, the Isthmian Wall was constructed, so they would have another great battle to fight. But the Athenian navy was able to lure the uh, Persians fleet into the Battle of Salamis. Within the narrow waters there, their brand new ships rowed by three ranks of oars, a type of ship known as a trireme, was much more maneuverable, didn't have to depend upon the wind, and uh, as a result uh, would turn very quickly and using a battering ram attached below the front of their ship, uh, they would punch a hole below the water line of their enemies and uh, sink those ships. So the Athenians were able to uh, destroy the Persian fleet at the Battle of Salamis, and this really frustrates any dreams that Xerxes might have had uh, for his invasion of the Greeks. Like his father, he's going to be frustrated. Uh, this Xerxes is the same person who's married to Queen Esther, and might provide you know, his failure here might provide some understanding of uh, uh, the feast that went on, where he's going to uh, eventually uh, move towards. Uh, deposing Queen Vashti, if you look in the book of Esther. With the campaign of Xerxes frustrated, he's going to leave his brother-in-law, a fellow by the name of Maradonis, uh, to fight on. But without a fleet supporting them, uh, the Persian expeditionary campaign is frustrated and the Greeks were going to stay banded together and eventually defeat the Persians at the Battle of Plataea. So these little Greek city-states are able to withstand the invasion of the greatest empire that the world had known up to that point in time. In response to this invasion, there are some Greeks that uh, want to rejoice in their victories. Others want to make sure to consolidate this, and so uh, they want to make sure they stop any Persian expansion westward. And as a result, they're going to create something called the Delian League. The Delian League had its headquarters in the island of Delos, a holy island. Each city would uh, give a portion of their gross national product uh, to support this league. Now, it's not that huge a tax as you look at it. You have to think, oh, we're going to spend 1 60th of our gross national product uh, for mutual defense. And as long as the Persians were seen as a threat, then that league holds tight. But eventually the Athenians uh, come to dominate this league and they move the treasury from the island of Delos to the city of Athens and then you know since they had paid such a great price uh, their city had been destroyed uh, there's arguably some basis upon which they should be re uh, rewarded for their activities. Their ships had certainly made a big difference. But uh, this is going to plant the seeds of the war that happens between the allies of Athens and the allies of Sparta, known as the Peloponnesian War, a war that's going to take place between the years 431 and 404 BC. Our source for knowledge about this war is particularly the Greek historian Thucydides. Unlike Herodotus, who at times is seen to be rather gullible, uh, Thucydides uh, looked for the causes of various events and is particularly interested in uh, explaining the motives of people. And so this is a very interesting insight into the cause of this war. Thucydides himself had been an Athenian general and he writes this uh, account that he does while he's in exile because he's fallen into disfavor. But what we see as far as causes of this war is that there's certainly uh, Athenian pride that was at work as they took advantage of their position uh, and as they were led by the general Pericles. Uh, Pericles had uh, used funds from the Delian League uh, to aggrandize the city of Athens and uh, when people didn't like what he did uh, he basically would punish them for trying to secede from the League. He refused to let anybody secede from the League and thought that, you know, 
the expenditures that uh, he was taking was basically reimbursement for protection from Athens and her goddess. Now, Pericles back in Athens with uh, new resources engages in some changes in Athenian society which helped to give it some certain level of strength as he continues to move towards democratization uh, allowing people to participate in government. Now he himself is a strategos, a general, but um, in his policies what we we'll find is that he's going to move towards uh, paying people for participation in government. Uh, previous to this, we had uh, individuals who served in the assembly as their civic duty. But, you know, if you're a hard-working farmer who is concerned about uh, making sure that the cows are milked, do you have time to go engage in civic activities, to sit on a jury, or to participate in government, or would you just stay at home? If you're not being paid for your civic service, well then sometimes people can't afford to do this. And so particularly amongst the lower classes, many people hadn't been participating in government. But as we move to having pay for civil service, uh, this is going to entice more participation by the lower classes and uh, involve more people. Again, this has its benefits and its downside, as some people will want to go uh, make their money this way of being in, paid for civic service uh, rather than doing other sometimes more productive jobs. Um, but it will get Athenian citizens involved here feeling that they have some sense of ownership in the city. Now the city at Athens has uh, a number of problems as there are some allied cities with the Spartans who choose to leave the Delian League. And Athens has particularly as a rival the city of Corinth. Uh, Corinth is located right there on the Isthmus, not far away. And the city of Corinth was a great in, uh, merchandising city with its two ports. And they're very large rivals for the Athenians for trade and the like. And Corinth had as one of its um, colonies, uh, colonies over in um, uh, the areas of Magna Graecia and Sicily, and particularly uh, at uh, Syracuse. And in Syracuse, uh, this, this would be a problem uh, for the Athenians. And so the Athenians basically decide uh, to uh, attack the interests of their rivals. And this is going to lead to this civil war amongst the Greeks. Uh, this is going to be devastating as these uh, uh, cities are going to be losing manpower and it's going to make them more vulnerable uh, to other invaders along the way. The Athenians uh, attempt to attack Corinth and this is going to lead then uh, to responses as the Spartans come to defend their allies and the Spartans have this great land force but the Athenians have the great navy. So we have this classical battle between Athenian sea power and Spartan land power. Led by Pericles, who had built up Athens and had built up the Parthenon, the great Acropolis and its temples and other structures, uh, the Athenians are quite full of pride. Uh, and in this first phase of the battle, led by Pericles, uh, the Athenians are successful. The Spartans come with their land-based power and they besiege the city, but the great walls that connect Athens to the sea mean that the city can't be starved out. And so this becomes a war of attrition. And in the first phase of this war, uh, things, things seem to be uh, fairly successful. And um, eventually a peace treaty will be signed uh, in the year 421. So you have the Peace of Nicias. But um, this will only come after a plague has beset the Athenians. While they can get to their ships and they can get food supplies to the city and the walls are too strong for the Spartans to defeat, um, the Athenians living at close quarters uh, begin to suffer the effects of a plague. And it's during that plague uh, that uh, 
Pericles, the great Strategos, uh, will die, and uh, the results will be that they're going to eventually uh, sue for uh, a peace. The uh, second phase of this war uh, begins as neither side is really satisfied with the result. They're still rivals, and um, the Athenian strategy is to cause problems for the Spartans back at home. They use their ships and sail around the Peloponnesus to talk to the Mycenaeans, the Helots, those agro-servants that served the Spartans. And so they would foment uh, rebellion amongst the Helots, they'd support their rebellion, and the result would be that the Spartans would have to have their troops retreat home to protect their domestic interests. So this war goes on for a long time, uh, and because the Athenians have superior sea power, they have greater success. But eventually, uh, the uh, Spartans and their allies will build their own sea power, and uh, at the Battle of Aegis-Bottomai in the year 405, the Athenian fleet, which thinks it's invincible, uh, was observed to take a nap every day. And so after they ate their midday meal, they'd take a nap, and while they're napping, uh, the Spartan navy uh, catches them sleeping and defeats them, and then subsequently the city of Athens is subjugated because they no longer have their wooden walls to protect them. Uh, they come to be ruled over by a number of despots who rule on behest of the Spartans, and Athens uh, loses its position of prominence. This would seem to project the Spartans into position of leadership, but there's a lot of rivalries that take place, and what ends up happening is there's a great deal of disunity, and this is going to make the Greeks vulnerable to subsequent invaders, as they're busy fighting amongst themselves, fighting ongoing civil wars and local rivalries. While this is a time period with certainly some political failures, uh, Classical Greece has a number of interesting cultural contributions. One of the areas that we see uh, particularly influential in Western civilization is in the area of writing, uh, the Greek language in particular. Uh, the Greek language is one that uh, continues to be used in a number of areas. We have a lot of loan words in English, particularly in the area of science. Uh, Greek was a highly inflected language able to express all kinds of shades of meaning as they would have three voices and uh, uh, use a lot of uh, particles and prepositions and the like. It's a very, very precise language compared to other languages. Uh, this is going to mean that their language is able to convey certain ideas more effectively, more precisely, and this will be very important as we're going to find their language uh, is going to be something that's spread widely and is going to be ultimately the language in which the New Testament is written. So, the Greek language has a great deal of influence in the development of the language of Western society in Europe, particularly in the area of the sciences. But in the use of language, there were lots of interesting applications, as we find that the Greeks were very interested in poetry, particularly poetry that was sung to the lyre. So, you have lyrical poetry. The Greeks were interested in words and word play and they used rhyme and meter to write poetry. As a result, those great tragedies we've talked about, uh, great stories that we talked about before of Homer, were written in dactylic hexameter. Uh, this is a particular rhyme and meter. And this will be something they pass on uh, to subsequent generations in Western society, uh, the idea about what constitutes poetry. Now, if you go to the Old Testament and you look at the wisdom literature of Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, what you'll find is that the Hebrews enjoyed wordplay. They liked acrostics, for example, so you find a number of uh, Psalms that have 22 verses, uh, with each verse starting with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, but most of the Hebrew wordplay came in the form of parallelism. So you'll find that there's uh, two phrases that come together. Uh, you might think of a famous passage from Psalm 119, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Essentially, you're saying the same thing 
uh, two different ways. This is what the Hebrews found to be poetry. But the ancient Greeks used rhyme and meter, and their songs would be songs that would be sung across the ancient world. And so the area of music is something the Greeks make uh, great contributions, and we see this back in the time period of the Persian Empire, where even though the Greeks are yet to invade the Persian Empire, in the time of Daniel, Greek musical instruments uh, were part of the scene uh, in the book of Daniel. Now, amongst the things they would write was not just music, as I'd indicated before. Music had a number of applications. It could be used for martial purposes to keep groups rowing together on a trireme without uh, getting all the oars tangled together, or uh, phalanxes marching together uh, against their enemies. They need to march in sync, and certainly singing and uh, the rhythm of their uh, music contributed to that. In the area of uh, literary things, using those words, uh, the Greeks would engage in the writing of history. I've alluded to the histories written by Herodotus in his Persian War and Thucydides in his account of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, this is just one of the areas where they're using language. They're interested not just in writing history, though. Uh, they're interested in debating things in the assembly, in the ecclesia of Athens. Uh, where people are talking about various topics. They are in interested in what people have to say. And uh, one thing that they're very famous for is their orations, their speeches, where people would use words in a very articulate manner, choosing their words very carefully. And uh, this is something that uh, they pass on. So you have orators who entertain people through their speech, and uh, there's an appreciation for words amongst the Greeks. Uh, a very famous orator that we'll talk about here a bit later would be Demosthenes, a fellow who overcame a speech impediment, uh, allegedly by uh, putting pebbles in his mouth and going to the coast and uh, projecting his voice over the wind and the waves. Uh, he grew to be a famous orator who would warn the Greeks against the coming of the Macedonians. But even though you might have good words sometimes, it doesn't mean that everybody's always going to be listening and responding appropriately. There are a number of areas of classical Greek cultural contributions beyond uh, the use of words. Certainly in the area of arts, uh, there's a, a lot of three-dimensional art that they create. Again, moving from music into the area of uh, physical arts, uh, what we find is they made some things better than they needed to be uh, to, in order to function. And so we find that they would decorate their ceramics this would be a major export that they'd have, but on their ceramics we find that they engaged in painting. Uh, we have red and black figure wares that show us insights into their society and their beliefs, uh, their values, and um, other areas that they would engage in uh, artwork would be, for example, in the area of sculpture. Uh, the early Greek sculptures, particularly in focused on the ideal form of a physical young man. And it looks very much Egyptian in its nature, with a very frontal uh, young man who typically has his left foot forward. Uh, it looks very much like Egyptian artwork. But eventually what we're going to find is they move towards uh, a variety of themes and more naturalistic artwork, rather than just showing idealized individuals. And their sculpture will be copied by the Romans, and continues to be copied in many ways to this day. Uh, some very famous sculptors might include the sculptor Myron. Uh, perhaps sometimes you might have seen a rendition of his discus thrower uh, with uh, this man engaged in the process of throwing the discus in an athletic event. Uh, another famous sculpture would be uh, uh, that of the Athena uh, produced by Phidias in Athens. There are many Greek uh, sculptures of antiquity that are preserved today in Roman copies. The Romans are going to copy much of this, and um, they're going to learn a lot from these sculptures amongst the Greeks. As far as cultural contributions go, the uh, Greeks also contribute uh, some architectural items. Certainly they made grand civic structures. Now that had happened amongst earlier people. Um, 
We've talked about the Mesopotamians and ziggurats, or the Egyptians and their uh, temples and their um, pyramids. The Greeks built agora. This would be marketplaces. They built temples. They built uh, defensive structures and theaters. Uh, when they built temples, there's a fairly standard sort of design with a cella. This would be a chamber for a cult statue. And surrounding that would be a peristyle. Uh, columns that would surround the, uh, uh, the cella. And um, perhaps the most famous of these temples would be the Temple of Athena Parthenos, uh, the deity that was the patron deity of Athens, uh, the virgin goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom, in her temple known as the Parthenon. The Parthenon was a magnificent structure on top of the Acropolis, which could be seen from far away. That structure uh, used Doric entablature and uh, in its uh, pediment, uh, there were that would be the triangular area at the front and the back of the temple. Uh, there was a f frieze of sculpture, sculptures that went around the, the statue talking about the origins of Athena. Today, if you want to see that, you'd have to go to the British Museum in something called the Elgin Marbles. There's ongoing debate about whether those should be repatriated to Greece, uh, but uh, the world's been able to see those things and they've been preserved in Athens, uh, sorry, in, in the British Museum as they were taken away from Athens. There are many other temples that were built and that can be found in various locations. Um, there seem to be some standard elements to them, as I mentioned, the cella for the cult statue and the surrounding colonnade that goes around these places. But as you look closely, you'll find that some have different style columns than others. Amongst the earlier Greeks, there's two basic styles. Uh, the boldest might be seen as being the Doric entablature. Uh, this has very sturdy columns that are sometimes fluted uh, that come to rather simple capitals on top. And then in the entablature above, we find that it has triglyphs and metopes. These be uh, sculptures that went above that. Uh, and then it carry a pediment above the uh, the capitals. The other early style in Greece is the Ionic entablature. Um, the Ionic entablature uh, has fluted volute capitals. Uh, it has fluted columns and volute capitals that are um, um, on the top. These kind of look like scrolls on the top. These are the two basic early styles, and then a later style that develops amongst the Greek is something called the Corinthian style. Uh, the, these are columns that have uh, acanthus leaves. It looks like vegetation uh, that are carved into the capital at the top. It's a much more ornate style, would have been more expensive to build. But these are the three basic architectural styles uh, that are used as they would put up these columns to hold up roofs. Now, people have used columns prior to this. Certainly, the Minoans used uh, columns. Um, back in the time period of the judges, we find that columns were used uh, by the Philistines. Columns were used in ancient Egypt to support structures. But columns basically have lintels that go across the top of them, and they support the roof above. But these styles are something that still persists today when people build monumental structures. Oftentimes, they'll emulate uh, Greek architectural orders, and uh, you'll find these preserved in uh, federal buildings here in the United States. Uh, if you go look at the Supreme Court or other structures in Washington, D.C., you'll find this to be a common uh, feature where we've preserved this type of architectural element that comes from classical Greece. As we move to think about other areas of Greek cultural contributions, uh, they've also contributed in the area of politics, uh, where we have participatory government, we have courts, uh, we organize uh, people into various groups which would be representative. Uh, we'll, we're going to find a lot of these ideas uh, from the Greek city-states are going to be passed on to other people, uh, like the Romans, and we're going to get a great deal of our um, 
political baggage in Western society uh, from Greek and Roman origins. Sometimes uh, Greek ideas that are translated by the Romans and then passed on into Western society in Europe. As we think about the ancient Greeks, their cultural contributions to Western society, uh, something of an area where it's very important is an area of uh, philosophy. Amongst the ancient Greeks, we're going to find that some of them are going to be uh, uh, unhappy with the gods. Again, religion pervades their society, uh, but uh, there's a growing frustration that they have with their gods and eventually something of a decline as we come to our next period of Greek history, that would be the Hellenistic period, we're going to find that there's a decline in devotion to the gods that takes place. All the stories of uh, Homer and Hesiod uh, are going to prove to be a bit of frustration. It's these gods are capricious and nasty, just like fallen people, and uh, sometimes they fail. They're certainly not faithful to each other or to mankind. But amongst the Greeks who are very, very uh, superstitious in many ways, uh, the Greeks are going to have something of a quest for understanding. And one of the contributions they bring to Western society is the area of philosophy. They were lovers of wisdom. They were in a quest to understand the world in which they lived, a quest to find order in uh, earthly phenomenon around them. And so they sought explanations. Uh, they wanted to make sense out of the world. In Greek philosophy, we find that the uh, earliest period of philosophy is known as that of being pre-Socratic. Uh, the pre-Socratic philosophers are something of natural philosophers who sought to understand the world in which they lived. Why is it that things are the way they are? The most famous of these early pre-Socratic philosophers is the philosopher Thales. Uh, Thales uh, was a person who established the idea that thinking was valuable. In observing that there was a, uh, an abundant harvest taking place, uh, Thales wanted to prove that uh, thinking could be profitable. And so instead of going out and buying up land and, or and olive groves, or uh, sorry, grape, grape groves, he uh, instead bought up olive uh, grape presses. And so when the wine harvest came, he made money on uh, turning the grape juice into wine. And he proved that thinking could be profitable. But uh, as Thales looked at the world and, and discussed the world and sought to understand it, uh, he was interested in uh, where things came from and you know, what the essential stuff was of the world. And uh, his argument was that water was the basis of everything. Other philosophers would rival his idea. So we have Anaximenes who would argue that air was most important. Or Heraclitus would argue that fire was most important. So uh, they're trying to explain where things came from. Now as we move a little bit later, what we're going to find is that in discussing the nature of the world, uh, Democritus is going to argue the world is made up of tiny little uh, undividable particles. They're just shaped, uh, they, they're configured differently as you have different types of material. But he's going to build the idea of the atom. It's something that's uh, not able to be broken. And the idea of the atom, again, the A coming out of Greek is oftentimes a negation in English. And so the, the atom here uh, is something that's not able to be broken. Uh, it'll be a long time before uh, that can be tested. And what we've subsequently come to learn is that the atom can be broken into uh, its constituent parts. The Greeks were interested in understanding the world in which they lived. Uh, observing that things changed along the way. Uh, what explained all those changes? How is it that things worked? So the pre-Socratic philosophers were particularly interested in the nature of the world. But with the coming of Socrates, the focus changed away from just uh, natural philosophy to subjects like ethics and politics and the like. 
Socrates was an Athenian philosopher who came from rather humble roots as a stonemason uh, who asked a lot of questions. And his questions would eventually get him in trouble. And they give a name to his method, the Socratic method, of just always asking questions. Socrates uh, got himself in trouble and as a result would eventually die because of his asking too many questions and annoying too many people, promoting young people to ask a whole lot of questions and to question things in society. He would be accused of atheism and the corruption of youth and as a result be condemned to death. We know about Socrates primarily through his student Plato. Plato records a great deal of what he attributes to his teacher Socrates. Socrates, uh, a person living in the aftermath here of the um, wars with the Spartans, asks lots of questions and annoyed a lot of people along the way. He's quite a prideful person in many ways and uh, this is going to get him to be in trouble. But he believed that people could know truth. And others had given up on this. Uh, other philosophers later on will give up on the idea that there is such a thing as truth or that truth is knowable. But Socrates believed that uh, you could know the truth and he asked questions in his desire to find out the truth. As I said, we know much of what we know about Socrates through his student Plato. Uh, Plato is another philosopher, philosopher who follows Socrates after his uh, suicide at the orders of the court. Uh, Socrates could have left, uh, but he decided to uh, take his sentence, and so he drank the cup of poison and died. Uh, subsequent philosophers would debate how wise that was, and certainly Plato thought that uh, the Athenians had lost a great mind as a result. Plato established a school uh, called the Academy near a gymnasium there in uh, Athens, and uh, there he taught his disciples. Rather than walking around as Socrates, he had a place where he would meet, and uh, he talked about a variety of things, again, oftentimes reflecting on the teachings of his teacher, Socrates. Plato is perhaps most famous for his political philosophy, as he talked about the nature of society and governments and politics, and he produced two great works, The Republic and The Laws. And what we find is that Plato was not so much a champion of democracy. He had seen democracy had failed in Athens, where people oftentimes supported demagogues, people who told them, politicians who told them what they wanted to hear, uh, rather than what was necessarily true. And so he thought the ideal society would be one that would be ruled over by philosopher kings. Uh, so that uh, these thinkers would be the leaders of society, and uh, that other people would benefit by their erudite rule. The uh, Academy of Plato would continue on long after his death, uh, so he established actually a school of thought in Athens that would continue for some time. In his writings we find that he again uses Socrates as a foil oftentimes, but uh, he's going to discuss uh, a variety of topics, as we've already mentioned, pr practical topics like governance, uh, but also uh, questions of ethics. Now, the um, school that Plato established would be one that would train the philosopher Aristotle, and Aristotle, while a brilliant student, uh, would not necessarily follow the teachings of Plato, his instructor, and he would create a rival school, the Lyceum, uh, where he would talk about a variety of topics, like Plato, his instructor. And uh, we're going to find that a lot of what he had to say uh, would be very influential, as he's a very shrewd thinker, uh, looking at the material around him with impeccable logic, and trying to systematize uh, knowledge on the topics that he addressed, whether it was politics, or ethics, or rhetoric, uh, he sought to explain why things were the way that they were. And in doing so, he follows 
uh, other traditions. Now, the Greeks had some great traditions that uh, came amongst these uh, pre-Socratic philosophers that uh, have important implications, particularly in the area of mathematics. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have, would remember the Pythagorean theorem, that uh, the square of two sides of a right triangle equal the square of the hypotenuse. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, this would be something that Pythagoras would uh, uh, discern. But Pythagoras was a philosopher who seems to be influenced by uh, certain ideas out of the Orient. Uh, he was an advocate of ideas like reincarnation. And so as a result, his followers uh, uh, would avoid eating things like beans, for example, where they feared that they might be releasing uh, spirits uh, and damaging spirits by eating certain sorts of things. But he was very much into number mysticism and the harmony of, the, of numbers. Uh, but you know, we do see that he's able to explain some things along the way. And uh, we'd be very interested in uh, the uh, mathematics behind music. So this is an area that's going to contribute to later Greek mathematics and science. But yet it also has some roots of some wrong-headed directions that will be dead ends that people would pursue along the way. Coming out of the philosophy of this time, particularly thinking about Plato, uh, what we're going to find is that they're going to th create something of a separation between body and spirit. Uh, but the Greeks always see these two things together. Uh, and this will be something that will be different between Western society and Eastern society. The body isn't something that is inherently bad and evil amongst the Greeks. It's something that they uh, admire, they portray in their artwork. They're interested in the activities of people. As we think about the uh, contributions of the Greeks, an area that I alluded to earlier that I seem to have passed over was the area of uh, drama. Again, they make poetry, they write books, but they also produce drama. And the traditional Greek theater focused on tragedies and uh, they'd have competitions uh, these dramatical presentations are typically offerings to the god Dionysus the god of wine and um, tragedy was the original type of drama uh, didn't have a whole lot of actors didn't have a whole lot of scenery but you had an orchestra uh, where you'd have a choir that would sing and then you usually have a single actor. But as time moved on uh, in Greek drama, we find that amongst the tragedies that Aeschylus added an additional actor and reduced the role of the chorus. So there gets to be more dialogue in the, in the drama rather than just soliloquies. And then Sophistocles uh, added a third actor. And so there gets to be, again, increased dialogue in these famous uh, dramas which are performed as religious festivals. As we move on in Greek uh, drama, though, we find they move away from just the original tragedies, uh, things like Oedipus Rex that told the story of the, the uh, uh, riddle of the Sphinx, for example. You know, what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the afternoon? Uh, the famous riddle is resolved, ah, that's mankind. People who are young crawl, walk on two legs in the height of their uh, strength, and then walk with a cane in their old age. Uh, a change that happened in drama was the introduction of comedy. Now, this isn't some sort of slapstick comedy. That'll have to wait until the Romans with new comedy. But as comedy is first introduced, what we know as old comedy, we have writers like Aristophanes. And what he engages in here is uh, social criticism. Uh, and so he writes uh, various uh, comedies, and they have titles like uh, The Clouds. In the clouds, he criticized the sophist philosophers who were, liked to hear themselves talk. And in his wasps, he criticizes old men who uh, instigate wars that young men have to fight. And in his work, The Frogs, he talks about demagogues who 
uh, like to tell people what they want to hear. They croak away and some people like to hear their song. The Greeks contributed a great deal to subsequent societies. Their, their uh, religion will very much influence the Romans who will take Greek ideas and mix and match their gods together. Um, their literary works will inspire uh, the Romans and subsequent Western society and people continue to make allusions to uh, classical cultural writings to this day. Uh, their uh, language is certainly important in Western civilization and in our civic structures we find that there's a lot of Greek models that are perpetuated in Western civilization today. So it's interesting to think about how society develops and builds upon those people who've gone before. Sometimes even people that might be haughty and prideful and uh, civilizations that uh, fall under the control of others. As we begin next time, we'll talk about how Greek society succumbs to the advances of Alexander the Great, who's prophesied in the scriptures.